let us pray. Most gracious and loving God, we give you thanks and praise for allowing us to be in this place one more time. For all the blessings that you bestowed upon us, the prayers that you've answered, for all that you have done, are doing, and by faith we believe you will do. We are invoking and inviting your presence in this place. Not that you need an invitation because this all belongs to you. But we want you to come in, and I pray, God, that you would fix our hearts and our minds, our souls and our spirits, that this would be a place where you would want to dwell. I pray, oh God, for a fresh anointing of your Holy Spirit, that it will saturate the atmosphere, shift mindsets, shift the atmosphere, shift it, God, that we might be in position to hear from you today, that we might have an encounter so that when we leave, we might say, oh, did our hearts not burn because we were in the presence of God. To this we say, to God be the glory. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, let the children of God say amen. amen. Let us uh, stand and sing our hymn of praise, uh, number 32 in your booklets, Hold to God's Unchanging Hand. Following the selection, the Reverend Arbutus Sickner will come and lead us in our affirmation of faith.
Spirit is going in. When the Spirit is going in, there's the one to church. I can start with any word. Let's be from my faith by the apostles' creed. I can be in the power of the Almighty. The faith of heaven and earth. And he is the Christ, the Son of the Lord, who was received by the Holy Ghost.
to their heart. And we come to praise Him. She's working right now. 
as the bishop's administrative secretary. Uh, I just saw Reverend Barbara Booker Rogers coming in. She's over in the chair. Amen. Good to see you. Uh, my Where are you? All right, she's over with the clergy. Now you know I'm challenged as people laugh all the time. Is there another widow that I'm missing? Raise your hand. We have more who are absent. But this is our time to say to them, we appreciate you for standing by the reverend, the pastor, and for being there to serve in the local churches wherever you've gone. We salute you again today. Our offering is only $20 in the Minister of Kindness offering. You can give by Cash App, dollar sign, Central AL Conference. All right, that's the Cash App, dollar sign, Central AL Conference. Or you can give the $20 cash or write a check to the Central Alabama Conference. We assure you uh, that the widows are receiving this offering today. Let us pray. Givelify, you can also download the Givelify at Central Alabama Conference. Central AL Conference. Let's pray. We love you, Lord, with our whole heart. We especially like sowing into the lives of those who've been faithful among us and who are still faithful. And so as we show kindness to pastors, widows, who've labored and who still labor in our midst, we give you thanks. Bless our gifts today as we bless the recipients. We thank you for the great return on this investment we make in the kingdom of our God and our Christ. Amen. Please disseminate. Two started in the rear, one going to the balcony, one for the choir and pulpit. Sister Joyce Hamlet, thank you. Come on choir, give us something to shout on before I start singing.
your lessons so that you can be looking 2 Kings, the fourth chapter, verse through the seven verses. You can read Isaiah and Luke when you get home. And then he will be followed by presiding elder M. Walker Strickland, who will lead us to the throne of grace. The wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elisha, your servant, my husband, is dead. You know that he revered the Lord, but now his creditor is coming to take my two boys as his slave. Elisha replied to her, how can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? The servant has nothing there at all, she said, except a small jar of olive oil. Elijah said, go around and ask all your neighbors for empty jars. Don't ask for just a few. Then go inside and shut the door behind you. And your sons, pour oil into all the jars. And as each is filled, put it to one side. She left him, shut the door behind her and her sons. They brought the jars to her and she kept pouring. When all the jars were full, she said to her son, bring me another one. But he replied, there is not another jar left. Then the oil stopped flowing. She went and told the man of God and he said, go sell the oil and pay your debts. You and your sons can live on what's left. This is the word of our God. In your life, you will go through and don't really know what to do. Just call on Jesus. He will see you through. For he knows. Jesus, he knows. If there's a trial that has come your way and you are looking for a brighter day, just call on Jesus. He will make a way for he knows just how much you can bear. Shall we pray? It's us again. The sons and daughters of the Central Alabama Conference. We've come this morning, God, first to say thank you for the journey of the past 364 days. We thank you for how you look beyond our faults. We are shouting because you met every need. God, we are thanking you for how you've allowed moments to roll forward while others have ceased and fallen asleep among us. We're thanking you because we realize that even at our very best, we aren't worthy of what you bestowed on us. But then God, we come with a petition this morning to say, we need you. Some, my grandmother would say, need you for one thing and others need you for another. 
But today, God, we are knocking on heaven's door. We're pulling on the garment of praise because there's a need in the room. There are needs individually. There are needs among us corporately. But God, we have been confounded in the promise that you will never leave us, nor shall you forsake us. For we are your handmaid, and you see the greater good even in our ways. So now, God, here we are. We're at the precipice of another year. We ask that you would endow us with a supernatural gift that will catapult us into new destinies, that will transform us for new ministry, yes, yes. that will rid us of old baggage and help us take on the new load. Oh God, we are petitioning today that you would move like never before yes, yes. in Central today. We were to be made new creatures for your glory. And then God today, we pray a special prayer that you would do something that you have not done for us before. And that is that you would make straight the road that have been crooked before us. Pick the rocks up out of the rocky, out of the rocky road that lay ahead of us. Then God, we pray today that you would bring down those high places that we might search earn the more. Then to God, as we wish for this prayer, we ask for your divine presence and every assignment that shall be before us in days to come. And that same divine presence, God, we ask that you would release it on your servant today that you would give him an unusual anointing today that while the gospel is preached some man, some woman, some boy, some girl may make a very conscious decision that I shall be greater, I will be more, I will live I will be victorious in God today when you whisper in the ear of your servant I ask that you would give him yes, yes. unusual standing yes, power. Yes, yes, yes. We pray for the delayed healing today. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. We know it's coming in your time. So let the word be life and light to someone when it's preached, and let it be exhausting to such a way that men shall say, I yield, I yield. What must I do? that I would be saved. And then God, those who don't know you, freedom today to say I'm coming God, here am I. And when they walk their walk to begin a new journey, give them favor like never before. And we'll be careful together to shout the victory for them. And with them we pray in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus.
somebody just say thank you? It is my distinct pleasure and honor to present the one who will present the preacher today. He is the presiding prelate of the Western Episcopal District, elected 106th bishop in the line of succession, served for many years the Simon Temple AME Zion Church in Fayetteville, North Carolina. If you've ever heard his story, he'll tell you that the first church he served, it was two people or two somethings. The preacher stood himself and a cow. He started from small beginnings, but look at God. Amen. Amen. He taught us on Friday that we got to fight, 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 fight. So if you get back to some of your churches and folk ain't putting up with your stuff anymore because they fighting, just know it's all Bishop Thompson's fault. <laughs> he is a man of Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated. He is married to the lovely Reverend Felika Thompson, who also dons the crimson and cream of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. Yes. And together they have two beautiful children. He will come and present our bishop. Will you stand and receive Bishop Brian R. Thompson, Sr. God bless you, you may be seated in the presence of the Lord. We thank God for you. Central Alabama, you have treated us so well. I'm going to make a request of the bishop that I get a conference evangelist appointment today. Because if you can feel this good in a place, I need to be here. Amen. We praise God from whom all blessings flow. We praise him all preachers here below. We praise Father, Son, and Holy oh, Ghost. God. It is good for us to be here. Today I stand to present my colleague, but most of all my friend a wonderful preacher, prognosticator of the gospel of Jesus Christ, Bishop George D. Crenshaw, born in Jefferson County, Alabama. Ordained, and I'm a little mad at this, and I need to talk to the Lord about it, because he was ordained in 1986, and I was a junior in high school. <laughs> but I look older than him. Looked like I'm gonna have to get some olive oil and put on my face. Married to beautiful, wonderful Miss Lorena, the former Miss Lorena Hardy of Birmingham, Alabama. Amen. We thank God for her, and we thank God for two children and that of the sainted mem memory of Brother Quentin and also the boss, Miss Kennedy. Amen. He's a man after my own heart because our daughter Alexis does the same thing Kennedy does. They forgot that we are the father and they are the child. But they eat all of our food, take all of our money, and hold all of our loves. Amen. Bishop Crenshaw has been blessed to and productive in ministry and has served as presiding elder and pastor. He's been in Indianapolis, Alabama, been in Smyrna, Georgia, South Carolina, where I was able to see some of the best work he'd done, which he's done everywhere, was at the presiding elder of the Sherrall Bennisfield District. And if you go there today, they speak the name of G Jesus, then Bishop George D. Crenshaw, then serving at Shaw Temple A. Design Church, in which he gave a little country preacher a chance to preach. And I thought I had arrived. Amen. He has many accolades, and he's done his work in Indianapolis. Uh, Indiana and getting his BA, then being able to get his Master's Divinity from Hood Seminary. Then the Lord was blessed with his wonderful work and a doctoral degree from Livingstone and now Clinton College. Bishop Crenshaw, 2000 James Barrett Freedom Medal recipient and past president of Hood Theological Seminary Student Government Association. 
Bishop Crenshaw was contributing writer of the Amy Zion Church Christian Education Manual in 2002. It's recognized 1999 as Man of the Year of the Lambda Iota, uh, Iota chapter of Omega Psi Phi. Now for an Omega is going to honor an Alpha, you know he got to be doing something. Any Omegas in the house? As one? That's about how many in Alabama. God bless you, we thank God for you, amen. We just thank God for you. I'm just messing with you, bro, amen. Outstanding Community Leader Award from the Bennettsville chapter, Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, Bishop Crenshaw, his community activist and was recognized as Citizen of the Year by the branch of NAACP. The founder of the Zion Center Community Development Corporation in Sherald, South Carolina, as well as the founder of Sherald Bennettsville District of the AME Zion Church Mass Choir. Bishop Crenshaw will tell you every he go first, he's going to tell you he's Miss Lorena's husband, Kennedy's daddy. Yeah. Then he's going to tell you he's a child of God. Yeah. And then he's going to tell you he's a member of something called the Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. Yeah. And since he's preaching today and I'm in his Episcopal area, I'm not even going to start with that voice. I mean, that, um, that scout troop, I mean, that, that fraternity called Alpha Phi Alpha. He carries it well, and he represents it well, so much so that they are so proud that he is a member. Also, we would say about this wonderful man of God, Bishop George D. Crenshaw, was elevated to the Episcopacy from the Shaw Temple A. Zion Church. He's the 103rd bishop in line of succession of the life of the African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church. The year he was elected in Greensboro, North Carolina, and I remember it well because I was sitting there in that seat hoping to be a bishop myself. But when it came time and down to it and I was sitting there, I was glad to be able to cast my vote for Bishop George D. Crenshaw because Bishop George D. Crenshaw is good for the Amy Zion Church. Every bishop is different. Every bishop, hey, you can give that praise. You can give that praise. He was God-ordained in Alabama who did well in raising this powerful man of God. And I want to tell you, Alabama's name is spoken in every Board of Bishops meeting, some kind of way, even before he says anything else about anything, he's going to say, you're going to take care of Alabama, Florida. And you need a bishop who's going to make sure that he represents his area. This is what I love about him. He don't take no mess. He ain't no chump and ain't no punk. He will sit up in there, and even if it's going against the grain of what everybody else thinks should be going on, he says, well, Mr. Chair, this is what I need to say. And he will say what he's got to say and drop the mic. He'll sit right back and say, now what? Because not that he's being disrespectful, but he realizes that being elected does not mean sitting back and wearing a purple shirt. It means doing the work. And he not only represents Alabama, Florida, but he re represents Christians. And I'll say this and then I'll sit down. That I believe that when both Bishop George Crenshaw was elected, that the Lord's divine hand was on this church. Because the church needs some turning. The old ship got some holes in it. And I ain't talking about the church up the street. I'm talking about the A Design Church, but the vote is still good. But it needed some folks on the ship that would help repair and send it in a new trajectory. And then the Lord sent us Bishop George D. Crenshaw. After a selection, we're going to do it in this order. Old Ship will give us a selection. And then Mount Zion will give us a selection. And Mount Zion, I want you to sing like you did a while ago. Because if you don't, your pastor gonna sing, and then I'm gonna sing. Which means y'all better sing better than you ever did in your life, amen. And after we hear from Old Ship, and then we hear from Mount Zion, in the tradition of our church, we will all stand and receive the 103rd Bishop in line of succession of the life of the A.M.D. Zion Church, Bishop George D. Crenshaw, amen.
my hands in total adoration unto you. For you reign upon the throne, for you are God and God.
God bless you, my brothers and sisters. Please be seated. To his grace, Bishop Brian R. Thompson, the presiding prelate of the Western Episcopal District, and his dear wife, Reverend Felicia Thompson. Missionary Supervisor of the Wesley Episcopal District, two of our dearest friends in the world, and I wanted to share Central Alabama Conference with them. That boy freaks Friday night. <laughs> Pain crew down, down at New Pleasant Valley because he, he preached the paint off the walls. But that's nothing new, that's what we expect. He grew a church from 300 to over 3,000. Not in Atlanta, but in Fayetteville, North Carolina. I didn't know they had 3,000 folks in Fayetteville. But the last one of them was down at Simon Temple. And we thank God for his ministry and we thank God for his service on the Board of Bishops. We left General Conference and gave him the toughest assignment, Western Episcopal District. But I'm telling you, he's done a marvelous job. Would you celebrate Bishop Thompson this day? To our presiding elders, our host presiding elder, host pastor, Reverend Dr. Kathy T. McFadden, would you celebrate her please? God bless you, everybody. God and elder of the West District, Reverend Dr. M. Juan Strickland, would you celebrate her And we don't ever forget where we've come from and those who led us over the way. Would you celebrate Reverend Dr. Jonathan E. Bill? <laughs> to our site pastor for the week who blessed us immensely, the Reverend Lily Ruth Stevens. Thank you for your gift and hospitality. And for our site pastor today, the Reverend Dr. Claude Schubert. Would you celebrate us? all of the preachers and pastors and district officers and conference officers and members of the Central Alabama Annual Conference and to the morning star of my life, Lorena Iveta Hardy Crenshaw. Our daughter, Kennedy, who gives all the directions, has joined us today. Would you celebrate Kennedy with me? <laughs> Quickly, let's turn to the word is 2 Kings chapter 4. Second Kings chapter four. Thank you, sir. All right, that's good. Second Kings chapter four. Uh, Doctor Shuford read it like he wrote it. I just want to read verse six in your hearing. Second Kings chapter four. I want to read verse six. The Bible says, "When all the jars were full." She said to her son, bring me another one. But he replied, there is not a jar left. Then the oil stopped flowing. Would you pray with me? 
speak, dear God, for thy servant heareth thee and wishes to obey. Dear God, let the words of our mouths, the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight for you are our strength you are our redeemer and we pray this prayer in faith in Jesus name and the people of God said amen I want to preach this morning from the title, I'm Coming Out of This. I'm Coming Out of This. Second Kings 4 begins with the sad story of a recent widow who's now facing her most difficult challenge. A careful observation of the text indicate to us the level of death within which this woman is operating. Although only one person has died, she recognizes there has been two Deaths. Yes, she said to Elijah, not only have I lost someone special to me, but you have lost someone special to you. Your servant, my husband, is dead. By implication, she is saying to him, because my husband served you, I have the right to make a request of you. Because my husband gave his life in the service, in ministry with you as his leader, I have a right to make a request of you. We're further made aware of her desperation, not only because she affirms the relationship of her deceased husband with Elijah the prophet, but we are made cognizant of her desperation when she adds the phrase, my husband is dead. We recognize in primitive Jewish culture if most women could not own property and if the husband is dead and if the creditors are coming to take her two sons not only has she lost her husband, not only is she losing her boys, but she is about to lose everything. Yes, this sounds strange, but this is really a common occurrence. She says to Elijah, I lost my man, and now my world is falling apart. And I won't stay here long because I recognize I'm on a sensitive subject. Understand I've troubled some delicate waters. But this text is not just about some widow 1,200 years ago, but this text is about every individual who has endured a tragic event that has weakened the stability of their existence. 
this text is about the automobile accident that left someone paralyzed. This text is about the illness that left the patient incapacitated. This text is about the mental breakdown of having to bury your child. This text is about loss. This text is about going to the edge. This text is about facing life's most difficult moment and surviving. I wish this text was just about some poor widow 1,200 years ago who found a remedy to her situation. But these seven short verses uh, is a street that each of us one day must travel. And regardless of your IQ, regardless of your address, regardless of your income, regardless of your career, life has a way of taking each of us for a ride down Heartbreak Highway. Life through this situation is not seeking to put a comma on her life, but this situation is trying to place a period on her life. Have you ever been to that place where life was trying to place a period on your life? Whenever the devil throws illness your way, the devil's trying to put a period on your life. Whenever the devil throws marital trouble and divorce your way, the devil is trying to put a period on your life. When everything you work for is slipping through your hands, preacher, when the church you nurtured keeps falling apart, when there are no words, when there are no phrases, when there's nobody you can call, nobody you can go to, nobody you can text, nobody you can Snapchat, nobody you can Instagram, nobody you can WhatsApp, nobody you can Periscope, nobody you can Telegram, nobody you can Facebook, nobody you can Twitter, nobody you can email or snail mail, you better recognize life is trying to put a period on your life. And it's at that moment when the devil reveals his plan and shows her hand, you gotta tell yourself, I'm not going out like this. I'm coming out of this. I don't know how, but I'm coming out. I don't know when, but I'm coming out. I don't know what I'm gonna have to do in order to get out, but I made up my mind, I'm coming out of this. And, and, and it's in these seven short verses that the text details for us how to come out when there's no way out. Well, well, the text suggests this. The text suggests, the text suggests that if you're gonna come out, first of all, you're going to have to provide private assistance. <laughs> notice carefully, notice carefully. Your Bible's still open. Notice carefully what the prophet says to the sister. He asks her, he says, sis, what do you have in your house? The prophet understood there would be no deliverance without her participation in the process. She responded according to the text. She says, I don't have anything except a little oil. Now she became depressed, but the prophet started shouting. Because serious prophets understand out of all God ever accomplished, he only started with a little. 
come here, Moses, standing facing the Red Sea. Mount Belzephon is on one side. Mount Pahithera is on the other. Pharaoh is closing in from the rear. Moses, what do you have? All I have is a little rod. God said, Moses, stretch out your rod. All I need is a little. David, where you at? I'm on the mountainside. I'm facing the giant Goliath. Nine feet tall. His armor weighs 200 pounds. A spear in one hand. A shield in the other. Well, David, what do you have? All I have is my little slingshot and five smooth belts. Wind it up, David. All I need is a little. Elijah, where are you? I'm down at the widow's house in Zarephath. I'm trying to convince her to make me a cornbread muffin. But she's afraid because all she has is a little oil and a little meal. Elijah, tell her that I said, go on and make you the muffin. Because if she gives it to you, I'll ensure that the oil won't stop flowing until the rain comes back. I've come to encourage somebody this morning who's been looking at what you have. You've been online checking your bank balance. You've been looking at your supply of medicine. You've been counting the quarters in your pocket and your pocketbook very much but you serve a God who's not counting on what you have you serve a God who's not concerned about what's in your hand he want to know what's in your heart he's not asking you what's in your wallet he want to know are you still willing to worship because little becomes much when it gets a touch of the master's hand. So when I come to church, I don't know how I'm going to make it. I don't know what's going to happen next. I don't know how I'm going to keep that girl in college. But I've come convinced that God can work it out. Because I didn't come focused on my ability, but I've come convinced of God's ability. When I rejoice, I'm not shouting over what I have, but I'm shouting over God's ability to bless me. Can I tell somebody, don't shout over your actuality, but shout over God's possibility. Because actually, you might be broke. Actually, you might be laid off. Actually, your bills might be behind. But you serve the God of unlimited possibility. Don't come with your mind on your pocketbook. Don't come with your mind on your bank account. Don't come worried about you and Boo not getting along. But you come with your mind on God. Because he still sits high. And he still looks low. He still watches the sparrows and the lightning bugs. Earth is his throne. Heaven the footstool. And the God you serve is able to make little out of God. Deliverance. Deliverance requires, deliverance requires private assistance. But not only does it require private assistance, but deliverance requires public assistance. Elijah says to the sister, I'm in the text, he said, borrow some jars from your neighbor. Borrow not a few. After you have gathered as many pots as you and your two boys can carry. Take them back to the house and then shut the door. I want you and your sons to start pouring oil from your little vessel 
into the vessels you have borrowed. Please notice now this act of faith Elijah requires. He says to her, borrow empty vessels. Can I tell you the truth? Sometimes when God is ready to prove that he is a deliverer, he will make you look bad. Everybody know this woman broke. Everyone knows she don't have anything to put in the pot she has, let alone going all over town trying to borrow empty vessels. But the prophet says to her, if you want the blessing, then you must go from house to house borrowing vessels from your neighbor. And someone in the balcony is saying, preacher, why would God put this woman's business on front street? Preacher, why would God put this woman's business on blast? Having her borrow vessels, having the women in the community talking about her down at the well. Well, it's because this miracle is not just for her. This miracle is for everyone who one day will arrive at a desperate situation. This miracle not just about some widow in antiquity. This miracle is about me. This miracle is about you. God says to the prophet, tell her she cannot go forward without them. But tell her that there's gonna come when they will not be able to go forward without her testimony. She needs them in order for the miracle to come to pass right now. But they're going to need her testimony when they arrive at desperation door. I wish church folk could make peace with their pains. So their testimony could bless somebody. If we could ever make peace with the fact that we've slept in more than one bed, we could minister to some sister who has promiscuity issues. If we could ever find the courage to tell some young brother, I didn't go to rehab, but I had a problem with the bottle. We could help some young man not spend the rest of his life trying to find the meaning of his existence at the bottom of the bottle. Prophet says to the woman, you must borrow vessels from your neighbors in the neighborhood because this will become the foundation of your testimony. Anybody in the house who recognizes that more than a car, more than a house, more than a wardrobe, more than a boot, more than financial freedom, what God wants to give you most is a testimony. Yeah, he wants you to look good, but that's not more important than your testimony. Yeah, he wants you to drive good, but that's not more important than your testimony. Yeah, he wants you to live in your gated, hyphenated community, but that's not more important than your testimony. And I know your neighbor sitting by you with the head cocked to the side, looking like they got it all together, but can I tell you something? Your neighbor has a testimony. Testimony. Bishop, I used to get high, but God brought me down. Bishop, I used to speak love, but God fixed my language. Bishop, I was depressed, but now I'm walking in healing. Bishop, I was hung up over a bad marriage, but now I'm in love with myself. Because when you have a testimony, you can shout in the middle of sorrow, 
You can praise him in the middle of your problems. You can dance even when the music has stopped. When you have a testimony, you don't need the praise team to get you up. You don't need a choir to keep you up. You don't need the preacher to preach you up. Huh? Because you know for yourself what God can do. Tell your neighbor, I may be broke, but I'm still driving. I may be unemployed, but I'm still in the house. I may not have a job, but my baby's still in college. You ought to tell somebody your testimony. I was broke, but God was depressed, but God. I was diagnosed, but God. I was laid off, but God. Well, you won't tell your testimony. I'll tell my testimony. I heard the voice of Jesus say, come unto me and rest. Lay down thy weary one by down, thy head upon my breast. What did I do? So I came to Jesus just as I was. I was weary, I was worn, I was sad, but I found in him a resting place, and he had made me glad. Last thing, last thing, I'm done, last thing. Private assistance, public assistance. But the woman said, you're going to need some providential assistance. This widow, this widow, this widow. This widow has taught her two boys that the Lord will make a way. Tell your neighbor somehow. Wish, wish I could stop and shout right there, but I gotta press. I gotta press. The text says, the text says she stands, she stands in a room that's filled with empty vessels. All she has is a pot of oil and a word from the Lord. In biblical days, God's word was enough. In, in, in biblical days, Pastor Stevens, God's word was sufficient. That's why when we come to church, we don't come for a fashion show. We don't come to network. We don't come to hobnob with the big wigs, but we come to hear a word from the Lord. She says to her son, bring me a vessel. This woman is really taking a leap of faith because if the oil stops flowing, from the little vessel in her hand, when it is empty, she's going to look bad in front of her boys. She has to make a decision. But there's only one question she has to answer. How bad does she want it? Is she desperate enough to risk humiliation. Can I just be honest? That's our problem. We're not desperate enough because when you reach the point of desperation, you act desperate. Uh, the story is told of the mother who heard that her son got hit on his bicycle by a car and the rescue squad took him to the intensive care unit, to the emergency room, excuse me, of the local hospital. Church members went to our house and told her, little Johnny got hit. We got to get to the hospital quick as we can. We called the members of the prayer band and we're gonna get there and we're gonna pray that God will intervene. When they got there, somebody had called the new pastor. 
pastor standing there and they're praying and they're, they're crying and they're looking out to God and they said, Pastor, would you lead us in a prayer? And pastor started praying and a sister started hollering and a sister started crying and a sister started wailing. And, and after the prayer meeting was over, they said to her, they said, Reverend, we want to introduce you to the mother. He said, you ain't got to introduce me. I can tell who it is. She was the one who was praying like it was a matter of life and death. Uh, can I tell you that's why the church deal with the same stuff week after week? Can I tell you that's why the church is hung up on the same hang-ups year after year? That's why the church can't pray drugs off of our babies, can't pray thug life off of our children because we're not desperate enough. Anytime you can come to church and throw in a couple of amens and wave a time or two and go back to the house without ever breaking a sweat, your worship wasn't desperate enough. Desperate worshipers can't help but holler. Desperate worshipers can't help but run. Desperate worshipers can't help but to praise him. This mother, this mother, this mother, she makes a decision. She decides. She said, I would rather fail with Jesus than succeed without him. So she stands down in her empty living room. She's pawned everything that she had in order to survive. Her nine inch rail box red bottoms, Paul. Her 65 inch mounted 4K TV, Paul. Her 7.1 Pioneer Dolby surround sound monitor, gone. Her brand new Lexus chariot, gone. She stands there with nothing but the vessels and her pot warm. The Bible says she starts pouring the oil. As she would fill the vessel, the sun on this side would bring her an empty pot, set it in front of her. She would pour the oil until it was filled, and then the sun on that side would grab the pot and pull it aside, and then she'd tell the sun on this side, Bring me another vessel. After they had repeated that a number of times, she looked at the sun on the left side and she said, bring me another vessel. But he said, mama, there's not a jar left. This widow told me to tell you. She said, I might be down, but I'm not staying down. I might be down. But I'm not staying down. Bring me another vessel because I'm desperate enough to do what I have to do. Because regardless of what I have to do, I'm coming out of this situation. And I've come to tell a preacher or two before you go out this morning. I've come to tell a member or two before you head back to work tomorrow. Whatever it takes, however long it takes, by any means necessary, you're coming out of this. You've got to tell the devil, devil, trouble can't keep me down. Trouble can't keep me down. Depression can't keep me down. Being broke won't keep me down. You've got to tell your devils, Turn off my lights. I'm still coming out. Repossess my car. I'm still coming out. Foreclose on the house. I'm still coming out. If I have to pray, I'll pray my way out. If I have to fast, I'll fast my way out. If I have to tarry, I'll tarry my way out. If I have to run, I'll run. If I have to shout, I'll shout. If I have to scream, I'll scream. But who the Son set free is free indeed. So I've come to tell somebody, walk in your liberty, walk in your freedom, walk in your anointing. Thank you, Jesus. I'm coming out. I might be broke, but I'm 
still coming out. I might be bruised, but I'm still coming out. I might be talked about, but I'm still coming out. And when I come out, I'm coming out with new joy. I'm coming out with new peace. I'm coming out with new power. And when I get out, I won't act the same. When I get out, I won't talk the same. When I get out, I won't be the same. Because if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. When you come out, come out prophesied. When you come out, come out testified. When you come out, come out glorified. When you get out, give him a crazy praise. When you get out, give him radical worship. When you get out, lift your hands and lift your voice. When you get out, I want you to shout until you lose your mind. I want you to scream until you lose your voice. I want you to dance until you can't even walk. When God bring you out, bless it like it's your last time. Worship like it's your last time. Serve it like it's your last time. You know where he brought you from. You know how he blessed you. You know how he kept you. Did he pick you up? Did he turn you around? Did he give you a new joy? Did he give you a new beat? Did he give you a new strength? Did he give you a new power? Did he give you a new anointing? Let me tell you something. 
For you to get hooked up to the hookup will change everything. I'm not saying it ain't going to happen today. I don't know if you're going to make it happen tomorrow. But when you got Jesus, he'll keep you when you cannot keep yourself. He'll let you have just enough oil to make you a, a, a cornbread mustard and a pool of water. But he will sustain you until you get there. So if you're here not saved, I invite you to give your life to Jesus Christ. It'll be the best move you've ever made. Just think on annual conference Sunday, you'll be able to give your life to Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know how many churches together are in the East and West Montgomery, but it really don't matter. If you are in the church in Chippen Switch or the one in Metropolitan, God still loves you. Because he wants you to present your life a living sacrifice. So you get not saved, you get saved right now. You heard the word, the word was right. The word was pure. It was direct and it was rhema word. A word fit for the whole house. And if you here want to give your life to Christ, I invite you to come up this aisle right now and give your life to Jesus Christ. As I said the other night, we sensationalize getting saved because of what we seen on TV. That you got to fall out, roll in the floor, and slop it from your mouth. But that ain't what the word of God says. It says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be what? That's all you got to do. Is believe on the Lord and confess that he is saved. God is a jealous God. He wants us to make him number one. And if you are not saved, you can get saved right now. All you got to do is walk up and give your life to Jesus Christ. Somebody ought to be shouting right now. Is that enough? Is that enough? And let me tell you, it ain't your job to wonder that you thought they already were saved. You need to take care of yourself. Sweep around your own front door before you try to sweep around mine. Because the person beside you ain't nothing but a made up mess. We ain't got that clothes out of the cleaner, put on some smelly good and fix they have. Still a mess. But when you come in contact with God, He will change everything. So if you hear and not saved, you can get saved today. I didn't say you belong to, to this church or that church. He ain't worried about you belonging to Mount Zion or old shoot. When you get to heaven, he's not going to ask you what church you belong to, what denomination you belong to. You better make sure he says, he don't say, I never knew you. I want to say, hear him say, job well done. You good and faithful, sir. You've been faithful over what? A few things. I'll make the ruler over many. But you got to get born again. And if you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, I invite you to come right now. One of the things that Zion has moved away from is, is concentrating on salvation. And the Lord wants us to concentrate on holiness. And if we need to concentrate on holiness, sanctification, and worship, he said all things are going to be put back on us. But folk got to be born again. Bishop said, you might work with your bank account. You will leave and folk will spit it up who don't even like you. What you drive? Somebody you can't stand to be driving your car. But when you hook up with the master, you got to worry about these temporal things. For he says you get some eternal things. So if you did not say, you can come. This is the last call. Somebody in here wants to get saved today. I feel you in my spirit. But you saying. I ain't worried, I ain't got my stuff together, but I'm sorry to tell you, ain't none of us got our stuff together. Not now one of us, not now bishop, not now elder, not now preacher, not now lay person. Ain't nobody here got that stuff. You can't get it together unless you have Jesus. Some of you saying, I'm gonna wait till I get back to my local church next week. You don't know if you're gonna make it past three o'clock today. You don't know. Come on and give God praise for I'm a 
natural fisherman and I'm a spiritual fisherman. I go to the lake to get bass and catfish. But when I'm in the church, I come fishing for souls because I know the harvest is plenty, but the laborers are few. There's somebody else out there. Some young man, some young woman who wants to get saved today. And I ain't talking about just age. Stop putting age on for me. I ain't seen nothing in the Bible that say that you had to be a certain age. All you got to do is confess and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Repent of your sin. And if you're here not saved, you can get saved today. You don't know if this is your last day. But if it's going to be, I'm going to be in Christ Jesus. So then, whoever it is out there that you're still waiting. I know this sister and brother came, but there's somebody else out there. I can feel you in my spirit. And you want to walk up here, but you're scared. Because you believe that you're not worthy. You are worthy because you woke up this morning and God started you on your way. Don't you realize it was God that kept you? How many realize you should have been dead or gone a long time ago? I know I'm supposed to be. I'm supposed to be either dead or in jail or both. But the grace of God. So if you're here not saved, just step out. Help me one more time and then I'm, all, I'm done. Look down on your road and say, neighbor, are you saved? Ask him, are you sure? And if you're not sure, you don't want to walk by yourself, grab that neighbor by the hand and walk with him up here. Tell him, walk with me up here. Come on, if you want to give your life to Christ, come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. There you go. 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 Another preacher, one of these male preachers, come here. One of these preachers, give it in. There you go. There you go. annual conference. That, that's what it's supposed to be about. And guess what? This is the seed that's going to be in Central Alabama for the rest of the year. Folks are going to come to church and before the preacher finishes, they're going to come up and say, what must I do to be saved? They're going to come in one way and leave a better way because they got born again. And all these folks got to do is confess with our mouth. One more thing, and we got to go. We got to keep going. If you out there and not saved, and you saying, I ain't walking up there, Bishop. I don't care what you say, I ain't walking. Just put your hand in there. And I'll lead you to Jesus right where you are. You ain't got to come here. You get saved right where you stand. Jesus gonna make it that easy for you. Cause he know all you got is a bruise of all and a little bit of water. But he says, you didn't come to die today. And if you out there and you want to give your life, if you're in the back of the side walking our way down there, I, I dare you to raise your hand. I dare you to raise your hand. I, I will lead you to Christ right where you are. I'll send a preacher up there to you. So if you're here and not saved, put your hand up. Because you can get saved. The most important thing you can do today is give your life to Jesus Christ. I know some of y'all said, Bishop, why are you taking so long for this? If we were taking an offering, it would be long. If we were sitting there doing reports, it would be long. But your soul is on the line. Somebody's soul is on the line. And this bishop thought it enough to preach that word that God gave to all of us. And it's touching your spirit. These ministers of ministry to these wonderful people of God. And you know why I wonder why folks are shouting? Because the Bible tells us we rejoice over the one that comes into the fold rather than the 99 that's already here. So give God praise for these souls that have given their life to Jesus Christ today. Receive this prayer in Jesus' name, Lord. I pray in the name of Jesus that you will touch and that you would induct these new souls into the fold of Jesus Christ. Guide them and protect them, lead them. Lord, protect everything that's about them because they've made a conscious decision not to work on getting saved, but they are saved today by grace through faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And we celebrate today because a soul has been saved in the Central Alabama Conference. And we say, thank you. Now, Lord, touch us all. Touch us all, Lord. Touch us all. Because one day, you're going to call our name. And we are going to have to answer the call. 
I pray that you will say to these bishops, to these supervisors, to these elders, preachers, and lads, that job well done. Good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many. It's in Jesus' name we thank you and we pray. Let the redeemed of the Lord say amen. Amen and amen. God bless you. God keep you. Have a smile upon you. saved in this service. Can somebody stand up and praise the Lord with me? Can you stand up and just tell God, thank you? Thank you! Hey, God! Hallelujah! Hey, God! Hallelujah! Wow! Hallelujah! You're right, Bishop Thompson. We've taken an hour to do some things. But what you just did is way more important than that stuff. Somebody's destiny changed today. <laughs> Somebody's eternal destination changed. Hallelujah. If you've been saved, you can celebrate that. Some of us were going the wrong way. And one day the Lord saved us. Hallelujah. Come on, finance committee. My God. Let me thank those of you who've been listening to us by way of radio on 96.5 FM at 800 AM. And we thank those of you who are on Facebook and YouTube who have been worshiping. You've been listening to the voice of the right Reverend George D. Crenshaw who is the presiding bishop of the Alabama, Florida, Episcopal District of which the Mount Zion, AME Zion Church, is a part of and 29 other churches. And we're so happy that you joined us today, and we want you to join us now as we give in the offering today. And you can give uh, by four different means. You can give by Cash App, Dollar sign Central AL Conference. Cash App, dollar sign Central AL Conference. Or you can give by Giblify, dollar sign Central AL Conference. Or you can write a check and you can mail it. Some people say, I don't use that, that, that uh, internet like that. I don't like to be putting my money or business out there. Listen, we'll do it the old-fashioned way, too. You can mail a check to 808 South Lawrence Street, Montgomery, Alabama, 36104. 808 South Lawrence Street, Montgomery, Alabama, 36104. And, of course, we like it when you just pull out the Benjamins and put them in the train. Today, we were asked to give $200. And our presiding elders have collected from all of the pastors who are present. Now you say, why well, do we need such a big offering? I'm glad you asked. We tore down one building last year. Uh, that's about four blocks from the Capitol that we own. Uh, it was sited, building was closed in disrepair. And now we've got another one that's just a half mile from the Montgomery Water Parks Recreation. We're hoping to maintain this property because we think it's going to be valuable. We've got two or three more structures 
You know, this conference is 128 years old. It takes money to tear down buildings. So I want you to stand because we've got to get your best offering. Uh, in this case, now we know we're COVID sensitive, but you, we want you to be fair. It's our conference. If, if the city cites us, then an assessment is coming. We can handle it today and not mention an assessment later. Because if the city tears it down, you're going to pay two or three times what we've hired some immigrants to tear it down for. Are you with me? Stand to your feet. We're going to give our best offering. Going to give our best offering. You said, Reverend Shuford, I can't give the $200, but I can give 150 and so we want you to give your best. Somebody says you're asking for too much money. You can never ask for too much money in the kingdom. You can ask for that outside. But remember, you, whatever you're given, you're given into the, the kingdom of our God and our Christ. That means that's an investment. And the only person who can guarantee that your investment will get a great return is the one who sits above the circle of the earth. He's the only one. They can't do that in Washington. The only person who can guarantee a great return on an investment is the man who sits above Jesus. You say, how do you know that? Didn't you hear the sermon? The Lord took one jar of oil, oil, paid off all of that lady's debts, gave her enough for her and her two sons to live on. He did it over and over again in the Bible. So just remember, don't ever give to your local church. Give through your local church to the kingdom because he controls the return on your investment. Bishop alluded to it in the sermon with the prophet Elijah. He was preaching Elisha, but he alluded to Elijah with that woman with that little meal to make one piece of bread. But God told her to feed that preacher. He said, I never saw that in the text. Go back and read it. God told Elijah, I have commanded a widow in Zarephath to sustain you. She didn't understand it, but God did because he controls the return on your investment. And the Bible says she obeyed the word of God. And as long as the famine was there, she and her son and the prophet ate after one little piece of bread. Father, we're going to believe you today for miracles. Your servant declared we're coming out regardless of whatever condition of state we're in. So we believe the word of God today and we're acting on it right now in Jesus' name. We thank you in advance for the great return on the investment we're making in your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Ushers, you're going to lead us. The stewards are standing, our finance committee. If you hold the baskets, the ushers are going to lead, starting with the balcony. The balcony is first. Come on, balcony, stand. Bring your offering. Bring your offering. The Bible says, bring an offering and come into his courts. That's what the Lord said. Bring an offering. Come into his courts. Come on, balcony. Come fast. Come fast. You didn't get money from your parents. They must be here. Get your money from them. I'm looking to see if my teenage daughter is up there. I know she spends a lot of money. And I know exactly where she gets it from. Come on, bring the Lord some money. All right, then we'll begin in the rear of the sanctuary. 
and you march down your offering. He said, bring an offering and come into his courts. Do it with joy, do it with gladness. Because Jesus said, if you give, it will be given back unto you in good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Will people pour it into your lap or your bosom? Bring your best offering. Come on. Come on, choir. Give us, sing my favorite. Let's do the God is good all the time. That's what I want. Come on. Follow the usher's lead.
understand. All things come of thee, O Lord, and of thine own. Not as, but have. We're giving thee. Hold on one second. We, we all had a choir. That's another. Keep playing so they'll keep standing and the choir can keep giving while they're singing. Amen. That's all right. Did not Bishop George D. Crenshaw preach this morning? I'm not a coveter or a stealer, but if it came from God, that means he got it from somewhere else. And since the folks on the West Coast are three hours behind, they may not have heard it. So whoever has this on Facebook, don't publish it, because when I get there in two weeks, I'm going to 2 Kings, fourth chapter, and I'm gonna say, this is what the Lord gave me. And I won't be lying. Because he gave it to me. I just didn't say who it came to first. What a word. Thank you, choir. Amen. All things come of thee, O Lord, and of thine own have, but we given thee. Seated in the presence of the Lord. 